the Apostle Paul. He is credited with reaching the Gentile world. He turned the world upside down by planting churches all across the Roman Empire. He wrote half of the New Testament, including the book of Romans, which many scholars say is the most important Christian document ever written. Let me tell you how important the Apostle Paul was. Jesus died on the cross, rose from the grave, commissioned the disciples to go reach the world, ascended into heaven, and came back to call the Apostle Paul into this ministry to the Gentiles. He coined some phrases and terms and scriptures that roll off the tongue of any Bible-believing Christian who's been at it for a while. Love is patient. Love is kind. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. For we are saved by grace through faith. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. For God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He established our, our whole theology of grace. He influenced the disciples and Jesus' brother James in Acts chapter 15 in the most important church meeting ever to open up, to open up access to Jesus, to the Gentiles. He literally changed the world through his missionary journey through the entire Mediterranean world. Later this spring, I'm teaching a series on Paul's missionary journeys called Road Trip. He is, he is an incredible figure. Cities, popes, and cathedrals have been named after St. Paul. The Apostle Paul is generally considered the most influential Christian to have ever walked the face of the earth. And he wrote this. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. It is a constant struggle and as the band sang earlier to start off the service I, Paul's just saying I just can't help myself right there's this there is this idea there is this idea of the way we've been talking about in this series that it is two steps forward three steps forward and two steps back that you, that you do pretty good, you, you move along, or you're, you're behaving and you're doing Christian, you're going to church, a small group, and you're doing all the things, and you're reading your Bible, and you just have one of those days, and you just slide back down no matter how hard you try. I just, I don't do what I want to do and what I hate, I do, and I have one of those days where I do one of the th those things I hate. Are you not encouraged? I am. Good morning, my name is Carter McInnes, and I'm lead pastor here at Mountaintop. And to me, this is such an encouraging idea because this man, who is considered maybe the greatest Christian who ever lived, says out loud what we all feel internally, right? That sometimes I struggle with living the Christian life. Sometimes I try to do the right thing. I'm moving on along and I hit one of those days and I slide right back down to where I was because I just can't do it. I climb the ladder and then I hit one of those days and I just do what I do not want to do. That in our pursuit of holiness, righteousness, in the Christian life, he names what we know to be true. That it is a struggle. And that is if I have had my coffee in the morning. If there has been no coffee, there's not going to be a struggle. There's just going to be a whole lot of sinning <laughs> and potentially a crime. But that, I mean, that's why I drink the coffee, right? I mean, you have those days, like, you know that it is just often a struggle. 
As we see Paul unpack this, we're going to find this reality is foundational to understanding the power of God in our lives. Without this confession, without this realization, without you and I owning this, we can get into some pretty dangerous places spiritually. So let me lay some groundwork that I hope will give some clarity to what we're going to see Paul say. And, and let me just say, hey, listen, if you're new in the room and new to faith, new watching wherever you are online, and, and you're kind of new to church, new to Jesus, new to God, you're checking this out today, uh, Paul is speaking directly to Christians. So this is really a message for Christians, and, but this is, just, this is just such an important message. But I hope it will cur- encourage you to know this is the kind of faith that you're exploring because Paul just gets real today. What... What he's saying is that, is is kind of saying out loud what we all think is true, know is true, but sometimes we want to pretend not. That a lot of people think that if you get saved, if you put your faith in Jesus, that you will never struggle. That that will fix your temptations. That that will fix your behaviors. And you'll be like, I'm just on the path now. And we, just because we had this event, and today we got baptisms, so many friends and family came for baptisms, and I mean, we would like to believe that we're going to have this event, momentous occasion in our lives, and like everything's going to be perfect from then on. But you know that's not true. I mean, that would be like saying you're going to have a wedding, which is this huge event where everybody comes and you pledge your love to one another, and from that point on, you're going to be a perfect spouse, And that is not our experience of marriage, right? It doesn't take long. You didn't have to say it that loud. Uh, um, Right? It doesn't take long that there are socks on the floor or there are dirty dishes in the sink. And the honeymoon is officially over. And you realize that it is going to be a struggle to live up to the vows that you made in the ceremony. And our Christian life is not, not unlike that. That we pledge, we place our faith in Jesus, but it is a struggle to live up to the vows that we said what we believe. It's a constant struggle. So here's the foundation. In your walk with Jesus, in my walk with Jesus, we will never have arrived. We will never have got to the point that we're like, I'm done growing spiritually. I've got all this figured out. I I have mastered this. The minute you begin to think this, Paul says that we are in danger, grave danger, that this this is a tough place. But now, this does not mean that there will not be maturity and growth and discipleship. This does not mean that we will not mature in our faith grow in our understanding of who God is and who we are in God, that we will grow from becoming a Christian, just a born-again believer, and someone who is, who is characterized as a disciple. Of course, we, we expect those things. We want good, good things. There is an expectation. There is an expectation that in our journey, in our faith, that though... And this is sort of what this series has been about. Though we believe in a God who came down from heaven, from the seat of glory, who sent his son down to square one where you and I are to give us access to eternal life. Though we believe that, our hope in the Christian faith, and Paul teaches this all throughout his writings, is that we won't stay there. That we'll get better at this, that we will learn, that we will grow, that we will become a disciple, we will mature. John Wesley was an incredible preacher and theologian in the 1700s. He birthed what was the Wesleyan movement, which branched off several different churches that are still around today. The Wesleyan Church, the Methodist Church, the Church of God, the Assemblies of God, the Pentecostal Holiness Movement. And you didn't know the Pentecostals and the Methodists came from the same family tree. <clears throat> but they did. And Wesley used this term when talking about this, that we are striving on toward perfection. Of course, we don't ever quite get there. We don't ever quite get perfect, but we are striving on toward perfection. And part of our mission at Mountaintop is that we equip people to follow Jesus. Not, we don't just invite them to make a one-time decision. We equip people. So uh, that's 
We, we believe in small groups, not just because we think we need something to do, because we believe that engaging the Scripture in community and, and challenging each other and learning from each other, we believe that that helps us take us another step in our spiritual journey. We believe in serving because we believe that serving makes us more like our Savior who came to be a servant. We become more like Jesus when we serve. This Tuesday night, we've got a night of worship because we believe in worshiping passionately that something happens when the gathered body in community worships, that, that when we lift up the name of Jesus, that God inhabits the praises of his people, that we encounter God in worship. We believe in mission trips and missions because we believe that something happens, something we move from one step to the other when we figure out that this world and this life and I am not about me, that it's not about me, that we grow as a disciple. So all of those things are all true, that we believe people should be growing, but, but what you and I know to be true is that we'll never get it all figured out. I mean, though we grow, we will not arrive. We'll become more mature and have one of those mornings where we do something immature. We'll become a disciple and we're like, man, I'm a disciple. And then we do something dumb. It's just part of what it means to follow Jesus, this constant struggle and this truth about our lives. And Paul says this is one of the most important theological realizations that we can all come to. So I want to go back to that verse that I started with at the very beginning. It's in Romans chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 15. And Paul has spent much of the book of Romans kind of arguing against this idea of of grace versus works, that people thinking that my works, my deeds, my activities, my behavior are what give me access to God. And Paul says, no, it's all by the grace of God. And then this, is, this chapter is almost his exclamation point of why works don't work. Because Paul says, even I struggle to do the works always. Listen to what he says. And we already read this at the beginning. I do not understand what I do. You ever have nights like that you go to bed and you look yourself in the mirror while you're brushing your teeth and you're like I don't understand what I did today just me okay that's cool <clears throat> I do not understand what I do for what I want to do I do not do but what I hate I do what I want to do I do not do Paul says I don't understand it I want to behave and yet I don't always in fact, sometimes I do what I hate doing. That word, that's a big word. That's a big word to say that I hate this. We're going to see this throughout all the passage. That what Paul is saying is that this struggle, this reality that we know we can't get away from, is not an excuse to sin. It is not a license to just do the sinful thing because, you know, well, we're all human. You know, we can't help it, you know. Paul, what Paul's saying strikes at the heart of what it means to repent. There is a big difference between hating sin and being happy in sin. Paul says can't be happy with sin I hate. I can't be happy with sin. I am not happy about this, Paul says. I hate this. There is a huge difference. There is such a huge difference in saying, I struggle with this blue square. I struggle with this temptation, this behavior, this habit, this thing that I can't quit. There is a struggle with saying, with saying, you know, gosh, I'm doing good and I do good and I have good days. And sometimes I'm able to skip right over it. I'm able to go through it. And then some days I come to this and this thing, I, ah, it gets me sometimes and I hate it. I don't want to do this. Paul says there's a huge difference 
and that and just saying, well, I mean, come on, this blue square is just like, I mean, come on. Well, I'm saved by grace anyway. God came down to square one, took me to heaven, gave me a free ticket to heaven. And listen, we're all sinners. I'm only human. And besides, I like it. It feels good. Everybody's, everybody's doing it. I mean, this, what Paul is saying is that is we have to decide is, if, if the struggle, do we like it or hate it? Paul says, I, I hate this thing that I keep struggling with. And I'm still struggling and I'm still fighting, but I hate it. He calls into question the nature of repentance. Did we really mean it when we said, God, forgive me? Did we really mean it when we said, God, make me new? God, change me. God, save me. God, redeem me. <laughs> Sometimes... It's hard for God to forgive us with sin that we don't care is sin. And then Paul is going to give voice to this reality of this tension. Of these, this two me's inside of me and inside of you. And this is a little bit like reading who's on first, just so you know. Remember the old baseball thing? And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. Paul says, in other words, there is a me in me that realizes that God's law is good. I don't always do them, but I want to. I know his way is the best. I, I, know, I know his way is, is the right way, and I want to follow it. But the struggle, Paul says, is that there is a war going on in me. And I'm fighting myself. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, meaning in the old me, that is in my sinful nature, that I still have this nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Now, this brings up, to mind this phrase that sometimes we use, we hear, you say, the devil made me do it. You ever said that? The devil made me do it. Satan's just tempting me. And though we, we kind of say that tongue in cheek, there is a lack of admission of guilt when we say the devil made me do it. We are trying to pass off responsibility, to absolve ourselves from responsibility. And that is not what Paul says. Paul says that the problem, the war waging in me, is I made me do it. There is still the old Paul living in the new Paul. There is still the unsaved Paul living in the saved Paul. Have you found this to be true for you? Paul says that I can't, the old me just isn't dead yet. And though he has a good nature, he's like, I've got a good nature, I've got a re redeemed nature. It hasn't fully occupied all of my heart, all of my soul. I want it to, but he's found this remnant of a sinful nature. And he, the line that he says is the very heart of repentance. I have this desire, but I can't always carry it out. I have this desire, and desire matters. Desire matters. When you and I get saved, we will not 100% change our behavior. Man, if I could sell that, we could grow a church. But we know that's not true. But I can 100% change my desires. I can 100% change my thinking. That's what repentance is. In, in the scriptures, when the word repentance is said, we often think it's mean like to turn this 180. It's not what it means at all. It's to, sh to shift our thinking, to change our minds, in which I say this former way of life that I did, sometimes I still struggle with it, but I don't want to anymore. I desire something better. I want something better. Desire matters. What do you want? Do you desire his way? Do you desire holiness? Or have you decided you're just going to do what you want anyway? Desire matters. Paul doubles down on this. 
And man, if, if this isn't like looking in the mirror, it was for me. For I do not do the good I want to do. You ever get up in the morning and you're like, I got good plans today. I'm going to do some good. Be nice to my children. Be nice to my coworkers. I'm not going to give my boss that side eye. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Paul says, there is still, though I am redeemed, though I am saved, there is the sin that is still in me. I'm not quite whole yet. I haven't quite made it yet. I'm not quite the person that God has made me to be. That one day there will come a day where the old Paul is finally dead and gone. One day there will come a day that I am finally changed 100%. One day there will come a day where there is no more sin living in me. But Paul says, not this day. Not on this side of heaven. It's a struggle. And he says, so I find this law at work. I mean, this, this truth, this reality, this thing at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Although I want to, you get that? Desire, I hate doing the other thing. Want to matters, desire matters. Although I want to do good, I can't ever quite kick evil. It, it's there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. In deep in my soul, I know what's right. I want to do what's right. But I see another law at work in me. Waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Paul just names it. There's a battle inside of him. There's a battle inside of me. There's a battle inside of you. And do you ever watch our band up here? And you're just like, I wish I could sing like them. I wish I could worship like them. There's a battle inside of them. There's a battle inside of all of us. We never fully defeat sin in the day-to-day -day struggles. You'll have victories. You'll have seasons when you get it more right and seasons when you get it more bad. This is, no one tells us this. You'll defeat one sin only to discover another. Right? You'll be like, finally kicked it. Finally worked. God brought me the victory. And you guess what? The closer you get to God, the more you realize you are not like him. The more you realize how holy he is and how much more work you have to do in your heart. What Paul says, this is such a, should be such a huge encouragement to us that even he, even this apostle called by God still faces a daily, daily struggle. You will struggle. Paul struggles. And I struggle. Um, can you believe four years ago, we were on the verge of a global pandemic. Does anybody remember that? I know we've like got that. It's just crazy to think that it's been four years. February 2020, we had no idea what our life was about to become. And uh, I was reflecting on this recently. <clears throat> During the pandemic, when we were all at home and kind of like, I don't know what to do. What are we supposed to do? And I just started some new spiritual disciplines in my life. And... Um, you know, and kind of just how I read God's word, how I journal, um, how I study, how I pray. And I, for the last three or four years since then, I have had just the richest season of studying God's word. I feel more in love with Jesus than ever before. I feel better about where my heart and my soul is than ever before. I feel closer to God than ever before. The word I write down in my journal all the time is, I'm so grateful so I tell you all that to say, I feel really good about my, I, I love Jesus. And right in the middle of that season, a couple years ago, I had a moment 
where I lost my cool with someone and said something, some things that I shouldn't have said. You ever done that? You ever said some things you shouldn't have said? And I noticed that this thing welled up in my heart, right? This thing welled up in my heart of what I wanted to do was what I wanted to say was like, well, you know, if you wouldn't have done this, then I wouldn't have had to say that. Or because you did that, I mean, I had to. Because we just want to defend ourselves, right? We want to claim some kind of holy and righteous anger. And after a night of reflecting and praying, I just got up the next morning, and it was two or three people, and I just apologized to them. And I told them, I said, this is what I said to them. I just said, I just want you to know I'm sorry, and I'm still a work in progress. And I know better, but I'm still broken. And I was wrong. It's so hard to say that, isn't it? Because I wanted to say, like, well, I mean, I read the Bible a lot. And I'm doing pretty good. And I love Jesus. And, you know, if you wouldn't have da 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 But in the middle of that, I was just reminded, I'm still so broken. I'm still so messed up. And I have a season of doing well. And then I just have a day that for whatever, and I'm just, I'm still a work in progress. Paul was much more explicit in the way he said it. What a wretched man I am. The most influential Christian to have ever lived called himself a wretch. I am a wretch. As devout as there anyone has ever been, it is a reminder that we should always be aware. We should always be aware that we are a square one people, that, that though we are being redeemed, though we are continuing to grow, though we are maturing, that that square one center still lives in us and rears his or her ugly head every now and then. And I love what Paul is saying because I believe this to be true. This is the key to having a soft heart. This is the key to continue growing. Confession creates continual humility. And this is why it's so, it is so easy for us to get proud and not want to confess and not want to admit that we're wrong, not admit that we're broken, to act like we've got it all together. But confession creates continual humility. A couple years ago, I heard this great story from uh, uh, the guy that leads the largest ministry search firm in America. If you don't live in the church world like I do, you probably didn't know there were even church fir- search firms for churches. But there are, and they help churches find staff members. And he was helping a very large church look for a student pastor, and he was close friends with the senior pastor. So he took this one on himself. And he had this one young man who was super sharp, super talented, seemed like he had it all. And he was doing kind of this final interview with him to, before he handed it off to their own team. And he looked at the guy and he said, do you have any moral failures that I need to know about? And the young man looked at him and he said, well, I am a moral failure. And he just sort of let that hang. And then he said, if you're asking if I have an addiction or some kind of illicit relationship or have committed a crime or have mishandled money that would embarrass the church, no. But I am a moral failure. I believe in grace and that we are all moral failures. And if this church thinks they're getting a student pastor who isn't a moral failure, then it isn't the church for me. Isn't that the point? (laughs) We're all moral failures. We're all a mess. And continual confession of that helps create a humility in us that we need. Here's, Here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to know. That the more you grow spiritually, the more you mature as a Christian, okay? And you're kind of, you're doing all the Christian things. And if you're new to faith, I want to encourage you, you're going to get better at the Christian life. 
Okay, you're going to get better at this. You're going to surround yourself with better people. You're going to go to small group and you're going to learn the Bible and you're going to make better decisions because you actually know the Bible. You're going to have more wisdom because something's going to come up in your life and you're going to be like, oh, I know that's a pitfall. I need to avoid that square because I know you're just going to get better at this. And then there is a temptation, the better we get at the Christian life, to look down at those below us and become prideful. We become prideful, and then when we inevitably hit a day that has a struggle, that has a snare, and we slide back down, here's what we do. We try to hide it. We pretend that we are validated in it. We want to ignore it. We don't want to talk about it. And here is the problem that the America has with the church, okay? It is not that it is full of hypocrites. It is not that they believe that a hypocrite is somebody who doesn't always do what they say that we do. The problem with America, the reason that they say the church is full of hypocrites is because we become a people who won't admit when we're wrong, Who won't admit that it was the grace of God anyway? And we can become prideful. And this is the attitude we start beginning, start getting. We start saying, man, I'm so up here. And look at all these other people down here. God sure is lucky to have me on the team. And that is why this confession that I am a wretch, I am a mess, is so important. And Paul says it this way. He, after he names this, he says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Who will save me? Who will rescue me? I deserve death that if it were dependent on my works, my works don't work. And Paul had better works than any of us. And this is his answer. That puts an exclamation point on the whole thing. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus saved me and is still saving me. This is the heart that we believe, of what we believe. That God sent his son down to square one to save us because we are incapable of saving ourselves. And we need continual saving. And we get good. We're all, you know, we get better. We're not holding square one all the time. We get to square 15. We get to square 25. We grow in our faith but let us never believe no matter how good we get how far we get at the game that we have somehow now earned our way and deserve heaven Paul says that'd be a dangerous spot you are delivered your destiny is determined by the one who delivered you not the deeds you do Paul says, none of us want our destiny to be determined by our deeds. None of us want our heavenly dwelling to be determined by our deeds. The only hope for us is that we have been delivered by the one who God sent for us. We have been redeemed through him. Luckily, our salvation is not determined on our ability to master sin or do the right thing you have a mansion in heaven because God sent a Messiah to earth and remembering this will keep our hearts soft remembering this will keep our hearts looking at a hurting world who we're not even sure has made it to square one yet. They're like in negative territory. But remembering this, will be, was, I was there too. And I'm better at this, and I've got some Bible verses memorized, and I come to church every Sunday, and I lead a small group, and I'm volunteering, and I do a lot of good things, but I thanks be to God. It is not about the deeds I do, but I have been delivered by the one that God sent for me it will keep our hearts soft on the mission to tell the whole world that they do not have their destiny determined by their deeds because we don't either let us never forget that he saved a wretch like me like you that is why we are crazy about Jesus. 
And that is why we call grace amazing. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your amazing grace. Let us never forget that you've delivered us. In Jesus' name, amen. No better way to 